So that's what was done. The major induction trial that followed was the arms trial. The arms trial, the uh, which I won't go into why the title is arms, I mean like it's got a drug company's name in it or whatever, but they sponsored it. It's a 370 patient trial, very similar to the Ginsler study. 370 patients here randomized to mycophenolate or IV cyclophosphamide. The IV cyclophosphamide again is on the older NIH regimen because again when these studies were started that's what was standardly used. So it was 0.5 to 1 gram per meter squared for the first six months each month or you got mycophenolate a full dose. You can see that almost all the patients who were randomized received the drug, the withdrawals were the same. It was analyzed, all 370 patients were analyzed at the end of six months. Now one of the strengths of this study was that at the end of six months, if you were doing well in this arm or this arm, you got re-randomized to maintenance therapy for another three years, and this part is double-blind randomized. So you can say, well, why was that in Jason and not the New England Journal? It was in Jason because it's only the six-month data that the Dr. Inglefinger, who will speak later, said she wanted the three-year data, the four-year data, always well, so we couldn't give it to you because it's double-blind randomized. In any case, the induction data is clear. If you look at the end of six months, if you're getting mycophenolate or IV cyclophosphamide by set criteria, decrease in proteinuria, stabilization of the creatinine or decrease, sediment is off the thing here, but you got to get rid of it, the exact same percentage of patients responded. Mycophenolate wasn't superior, but it wasn't inferior to IV cyclophosphamide. If you looked at the serum creatinines, now these are micromoles per liter, so you know if you're European you'll enjoy it, if you're US, 88 micromoles per liter is one milligram per deciliter. They come down. Proteinuria four to five grams a day, like in every study, comes down equivalently between the two. If you look at the serology, MMF is in yellow, cyclophosphamide is in blue. Here you can see anti-DNA falls with the mycophenolate over six months, it falls with cyclophosphamide. C3 goes up in both, fourth component of complement goes up in both. Albumin, which starts low here, comes up with both as the proteinuria goes away. So everything, everything was equivalent in this study. If you look at the side effects in this study, and these are the side effects that were present in more than 10% of patients. So there were some things that we expected and some things that were a surprise. We expected that GI side effects and diarrhea would be most in the MMF. 28% had this. Now let me emphasize this is a worldwide study. A third of the patients were from U.S. now, a third of the patients were in China, and a third of the patients in South America and Europe. So it's a true international study, so you can look at many different variables in here. But again, if you take the side effects, 28% diarrhea here, if you look at IV cyclophosphamide, nausea and vomiting was number one, 45% and 37%. Hair loss, alopecia, 35% of the cyclophosphamide, 10% of the mycophenolate. So that's a real difference. Now, if you're sitting there and wondering, well, why do 20% of this group have headache and 26% of this group have headache? As I always like to say, when you do a control randomized trial, headache is always the most common side effect in both groups. Even with placebo, it's the most common side effect. In fact, 25% of the investigators get a headache doing the study. So that's uniform, you know, not to be expected. The big surprises were here in the mortality. There were only 14 deaths of the 370 patients. Now again, this is the first six months where it's most intensive, much lower mortality rate than you had gotten in older studies. If you looked at all the older trials in the U.S. and it's just a lower mortality rate. I showed you the Ginsler trial, you know, again. So the other thing that was a surprise was there were nine deaths with mycophenolate and only five deaths with cyclophosphamide. Now it turns out six of the nine deaths with the mycophenolate were from China, five in one center. 
Obviously, if you exclude that center, mycophenolate looks much better. There was no mortality from mycophenolate in Europe or the United States. So what conclusions can you draw from that? The only conclusion is if you have bad lupus nephritis, don't go to that center in China. I mean, that's pretty clear. But, you know, but aside from that, the numbers are very low in terms of mortality. But I'll show you, that's what's happened. The mortality has gone down, down, down. We're doing better and better and better. So the ARMS trial did not show that mycophenolate was superior to cyclophosphamide. The response rate for renal and non-renal parameters was exactly the same. They were equivalent drugs. Now, of course, that meant that many, many people who switched their patients over to mycophenolate. They said, well, it's a more benign drug. If the you know, course looks good in the first few months, you know, long term, it's going to make a difference in terms of what they get for toxicity. Adverse events were broadly similar over 24 weeks and consistent with previous reports. And of course, there was the question of the ongoing maintenance therapy, the double-blind randomized trial. So I'm going to show you this in a minute, but I want to go a little on the side here and just mention membranous nephropathy. Membranous lupus makes up somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of all the biopsies that are done in severe lupus, people with heavy proteinuria, etc. But the therapy has been varied. Some people use steroids, some people use cyclosporin, some people use cyclophosphamide. All of them have worked in small randomized trials. One of the questions is, can you use mycophenolate? And the answer is yes. This is a composite study that my colleague J. Radhakrishnan put together looking at 84 patients in the Ginsler trial and the ARMS trial. These all had pure membranous lupus, no proliferative lesions whatsoever, 42 in each group. This is complete and partial remissions at the end of six months. Now, this is not percent. These are the actual numbers here. There were about 30 in each arm. So about two-thirds of the patients in the cyclophosphamide arm had a complete or partial remission, about two-thirds in the mycophenolate arm. There are many more partial than complete because the proteinuria takes a while to go away. If you follow them out to a year, you get more and more complete and fewer and fewer partial remissions. But the answer is, if you say, is there data to use mycophenolate, this is the best data. It looks the same as IV cyclophosphamide, which looks pretty much the same as using steroids and a calcineurin inhibitor. Almost anything works in membranous lupus in two-thirds to three-quarters of the patients. In the others, you've got to toss around between different therapies. I'd start with the most benign thing first, and I would only treat the membranous lupus who are nephrotic. If they have subnephrotic proteinuria, you can give them a little bit of steroids or, you know, but again, I would not treat them vigorously because they're going to do well. Again, whatever you're treating the rest of their disease, they're going to do very well. Okay, back now to severe lupus nephritis where you always need therapy. So in the ARMS trial, we said they averaged a gram and a half BID for six months of mycophenolate or 0.5 to 1 gram per meter squared of cyclophosphamide because this was the older regimen that was used. If you were doing well here, you got re-randomized to three years of mycophenolate or azathioprine, double-blind randomized. If you're doing well here, you got re-randomized here to three years. Now, if you asked me the results of this trial, I would have said they're going to come out the same. The two drugs, the oral agents, look very similar in Gabe Contreras' small study. Azathioprine has been around a long time. You're only taking the patients who are doing well here. Now, you'll see it's the majority of them. But even so, you're only taking the patients who are doing good. How much better could mycophenolate be than azathioprine? Well, the answer is it can be better. So this is 227 patients we're talking about here. This is the probability of being event-free, which is death, dialysis, or doubling the creatinine. Here's the mycophenolate group doing significantly better than the azathioprine group over the three years. Now let's look at the details here. This is patients here who had treatment failure. So this is doing badly up here. 
If you were in the mycophenolate group, 16% were treatment failures. If you're in the azathioprine group, 30-something percent were treatment failures. End-stage renal disease, only with azathioprine. Renal flares, more common with azathioprine. Creatinine doubled, more common with azathioprine. Rescue immunosuppression needed, more common with azathioprine. Some FDA broad definition, again, worse with azathioprine. Remember, this is double-blind randomized, so there's no way you can fudge the data here. No matter which of the criteria you use, the mycophenolate came out better. Now, because this is international and because it's a large study, we had 227 patients analyzed in this follow-up, this three-year maintenance. If you looked at the overall, this is the failure rate again. You can see 30-something percent azathioprine, 17 percent, 16, 17 percent mycophenolate. It was true whether you were white, black, Asian, or other. Every group, the azathioprine did worse than the mycophenolate. If you looked at U.S., Canada, Latin America, Asia, Europe, every single group, the azathioprine did worse. Now, it was closest, actually, in Europe, though. Here, this is not significant. Some of these are very significant here. If you started out on mycophenolate for six months, and got randomized to mycophenolate, you did better than if you started out on mycophenolate and got randomized to azathioprine. If you started out on IV cyclophosphamide and got randomized to mycophenolate, you did better than if you started out on IV cyclophosphamide and got randomized to getting azathioprine long term. So no matter how you looked at it, every single analysis we did, it's the only study I've ever done where all the analyses came out the same, the mycophenolate came out better. So MMF was superior to azathioprine in maintaining renal response and preventing relapses in patients with active lupus nephritis who were responding to the induction therapy. These aren't the treatment failures. These are the 227 who are doing well. The failure rate, 32% azathioprine, 16% MMF was highly significant. The superiority of MMF was there regardless of induction treatment regimen, regardless of race, regardless of region, and it was confirmed by every single secondary endpoint. If you look at serious adverse events and withdrawals, they were more common with azathioprine. There was more leukopenia and more infection with the azathioprine here. So if you look at this, it was a pretty clean sweep here, you know, and it's a gold medal for mycophenolate and maybe a brass medal for the azathioprine here. Now, one of the reason why do I say there was a brass medal for the azathioprine? What was the mortality in these 227 patients followed the three years? The total death rate, one person. One person died in three, this is China, U.S., South America, worldwide, one person died. It was an auto accident in the azathioprine arm. There's not another death. If you can get your patient into remission, they're going to do terrifically long-term with this induction and maintenance regimen here. So again, it just shows how far we've come because you'd never do that well in an older study 10 years ago. Now, some people have said, well, there's European data that contradicts that. Not really. That, uh, you know, when our paper came out in the New England Journal, the arms maintenance trial, Fred Husio wrote the editorial, and I think he's explained it in that.